a business that operates in a loving, kind, just, and ethical environment is going to do business better on average every time than a business that is corrupt. That's billionaire Steve Sarowitz. These are some of the most valuable gems I've gleaned from wonderful and accomplished people in a diversity of fields. In the spaces where I've tried to elevate discussions, it often ties back to the core values and asking, oh, is this decision or is this actually coherent with this value that we talk about? And asking in a way where we all reflect on it, right? It's not a huge story like, oh, is this, you know, if, if trustworthiness is one of our pillars, does the messaging of this advertisement or is does this, you know, enhance trustworthiness with our clients, customers, patients, or does it, you know, um, compromise it? One of the highlights of the past year in my company was we have a webinar series that we do and you know our marketing team was doing started doing marketing on like linkedin i was traveling on our team and you know there's a lot of autonomy so people build you know the advert put it out um so there isn't like this heavy micromanagement side of things all of a sudden someone on slack said hey i just saw the last advert and I saw that it says, look, you know, hurry up, sign up. There's only a few seats left. He's like, is that true? Is it a webinar? Is there a limited number of seats? Because I don't think that's coherent with our principles of being like truthful and trustworthy. And there was a moment of like such excitement for me that it wasn't me that pointed it out. That this was a person who's in our, on our team, owning our principles, feeling comfortable enough to ask that question. And th I mean, they are, this was a person who's like involved in machine learning, like nothing to do with like the marketing side. So they weren't also like, oh, it's not my, de my department. Like, so I celebrated that because I'm like, look, we're going to make a ton of mistakes. So it's not about not making mistakes. We're going to make the mistakes. Is having that space where we all can contribute to that learning process and helping us refine. Because we're going to have patterns of behavior that are unconscious from the past, from other spaces, other industries. And we'll innocently come in in the you know, need to like just get things done. We may make these little mistakes. And you know, the so it became a point of celebration for us. And I was, I was I felt really happy. Um, of that mistake. What about for leadership and environment? It's, it's not a question of what you say you do, but how do you do it? So I think for an organization, I think the most important thing is to, is to be very public with your values. Number two, have training on those values. Mm -hmm. I don't think you, you don't just say it. You say it, you train on it, and then you manage to it. And then you deal with the problems that even occur when you do it with the best of intentions. When companies are building products, if they're expecting to continuously build with um, this posture of action reflection consultation within the enterprise throughout the life of that product, then it's much more likely to be of service. Really at the heart of the leadership vision is for leaders to want to be of service and they're building products that they're truly curious about whether or not every iteration, every change is continuing to be of service anywhere, any new place that the product is delivered to or scaled, that the product is continuing to be of service. And, and they have that posture of curiosity and a service orientation throughout for their entire the enterprise. And so, and their goal is to then establish this learning culture. I feel like being able to create an environment where people can come together and share consult, deeply understand each other, decide on a course of action together and together collectively get up and do whatever they have decided to do, um, really manifests in something that is even better than I personally individually would have conceived. And I think the joy that is created, the confidence that comes from working in such a way 
the encouragement that comes from working in such a way feels very powerful. It feels very empowering, I should say. Um, so I think work that one can take pride in is work that brings people together and empowers each other to realize the emergent powers of a collective. And I think that's something the more and more we can do that and develop, I'm really developing still my capacities in that area. But the more of us that can do that, that can bring people together, especially diverse peoples and build consensus and work together, um, I think it's something for everybody to really rejoice and celebrate it. There are clearly many problems in the world. So how can we get at the root cause of them? So systems are almost like a living organism. Today, when we build or try to change a system, we try to switch in pieces here and there because of budget constraints. And we make constant compromises. And we end up with things that are not reflective of the ultimate goal. Um, and especially around technology that's intangible, the people making decisions are often far removed from people using the tools. So you have this level of um, disentanglement of the impact of what you're trying to achieve. And it feels, it, it's disheartening for those in the front line. There's a level of moral injury that people talk about. They feel that, wow, you know, the behaviors of the organization institute are, is not consistent with what we need. And I think it's a pure opportunity, missed opportunity around communication and a line around vision. There's a huge gap between building unity of vision and unity of action. And we need to, you know, it's not just a series of posters and slogans. It has to be coherent across. And if there's any, any one of those areas, there's a failure. You have to be disciplined in dissecting it out why. Why are our actions not consistent? It's well, maybe your thoughts are not. So you have to discover like, what are, how do we think about this? Is our perspective different? And if that's off, it's like, well, what's our vision? What's your vision? And we don't, we don't, I don't think we have a culture today that amplifies that process. Um, so what I mean by moving around systems and the stuff, I think we're so focused on the material fixes, like, oh, we'll hire this, we'll do this here, that we're not having the actual discourse that we need that will naturally then allow us to take actions to evolve the systems we're in. Do you think those big shifts can happen or does it have to be modeled from the ground up? So there is a intertwinement between individuals, the organization, and the institutional policies. And yes, you need leadership that's brave to make changes in the, at the leadership level, as well as the management level. You also need individuals willing to be vulnerable and be part of that growth. And these systems have to all work together and in, in create that kind of atmosphere. If one of them doesn't want to comply, the whole system fails. We have a society which is out of balance. We have racism, we have sexism, we have nationalism, we have religious prejudice, we have war, we have greed, we have corruption. And so these human failings are at the root of human problems. So if you look at the world today and, and realize how much money, and especially now is a good time to say it this week, how much money is going into war, how much money is going into greed and corruption. And you take if you took that money and, and invested it to, in the betterment of society, it would help us tremendously materially. Um, you know, if you look at the imbalances, the inequities in the world, these things are things that we could, that we need to address. And instead of just giving someone a, a meal for the day, why can't they afford a meal on their own? What is, what is stopping them from being productive or from being paid for their production? So again, looking at all the problems um, from more the source of the problem rather than here's the problem. Um, I recently went to uh, Clinton Global uh, Global Health Initiative and 
a lot of well-meaning people and they talked about, well, there's a war in Sudan, there's a war in Ukraine, and these people were hurt by the war. And But they never asked why was there a war? They just said, these people are, let's help the people hurt by the war. But I'm looking and saying, why did the war start? What are the, what are the root causes of war? And that's what I'm trying to, to address with my philanthropy. What I think long-term, what philanthropy should be doing is looking at the things that are at the core of the problems of humanity. I believe that we are primarily spiritual beings and that the primary causes of our problems and the solutions to our problems are in the spiritual realm, not as much in the physical realm. I think we should focus in terms of philanthropy on the spiritual um, as as a really a root of the physical. And so it's not to say we shouldn't feed the hungry or 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 give housing to the homeless, but we should look at the reasons how we got here and try to look at those underlying reasons. So we're not continually on this hamster wheel of trying to, to fix the problems without ever trying to solve them. Why is now so important? So at every moment in history, humanity has had different challenges, it's had different capacities, and we see that when we look at the history of the world. Um, and so from the vantage point of the United Nations, which is an institution that was really constructed to ensure that the world never sees the horrors of war again. That was the initial impetus. And so, you know, you kind of, you know, back in the early 1900s, um, humanity has gone through a lot. We've gone through two major world wars. We've come to a place where we've said never again, and we've created this institution of the United Nations as a place where countries and, and diverse peoples can come together to consult to really try to seek understanding with each other instead of resorting to conflict and war. Um, but we still see the limitations of that. And our world is not a world yet where we have peace everywhere. And sometimes I think we feel like we have peace or we've achieved a certain level of maturity. But then again, conflict arises. Conflict pops its head up in, you know, places where it's happened in the past, it raises its head again. In parts of the world where we never expect there to be conflict, we now see conflict. Um, we see in countries, you know, a real increase in polarization, in othering. We're still grappling with what humanity's relationship is with the environment, um, between women and men, between young and old. So there are still many areas where you could say humanity is trying to develop its capacities and we're seeing almost the fits and starts of a world civilization that's trying to come of age we're trying to find ourselves there are aspects that have been tremendously advanced we are in an age of the internet there's ai there's airplanes that transport us from one end of the world to the other so technologically our material developments in certain parts of the world has really strengthened. Um, I think humanity is really in a stage of transition towards a place of maturity where there is justice, where there is equality, where anyone who's born in any part of the world in the future will have the opportunity to fully develop their talents and realize a meaningful contribution to the world, where they will have access to technology, where they can live a safe life, um, so we're moving in that direction and I, I, I am very hopeful for that. I do feel in the last century, particularly the development and growth of humanity has really been exponential. And I really feel like that's only going to increase. Um, I do think in the same way that, you know, a child learns how to walk it, you know, stumbles and falls in the beginning it's it puts one foot after the other and it falls but it continues to pick itself up and i think you know we've we've gone past that stage we've moved through the phase of childhood and we're now at a stage of collective adolescence you could say where these new capacities have really come to the fore but we're not yet sure how to use them and when humanity gets to this place of, of a real maturity, I think that's when we'll see a flourishing of collective capacity, 
um, an even further flourishing of technology, but also of the arts and of very different ways of living and very different ways of constructing our society um, to prioritize different things, um, to really be much more collaborative with each other, to really nurture human well-being and human nobility. And I'm hoping that that time is going to find us pretty soon. It makes me optimistic as people, right? I've seen transformation at many different levels, individuals. And yes, there's a lot of hard things happening. But I have faith that people want to be good. And in the right conditions, people can rise up. And I think we're at a breaking point where people are seeing that something has to change. And there will be that, that passion that today, without, without a proper avenue, could lead to you know, resentment and anger and divisiveness. That same level of passion can be redirected towards a unit division that's exciting and empowering.